Hello, and welcome to Similar Species Conundrum. You may know me as Ida Gray, you may know me as Birding for the Common Man, or you may not know me at all. Hi, I'm Josh, and today we're going to be discussing a couple species that are similar in the field. We're going to be dealing with a couple of the peeps today. So these are the Dunlin-like sandpipers. Uh, the Dunlin is an extremely common bird here where I'm from, which is New Jersey. Um, and the problem is that in a flock of Dunlin, there could be other species hiding in there. And today we're going to discuss some of the species that you might find in the flocks. So first we'd like to uh, go over a couple of the species that you'll see. And the, we are covering two species alongside the Dunlin today. Those two species would be the stilt sandpiper and the curlew sandpiper. So when finding a group of uh, birds in the, the wild or wherever you happen to be, you're going to be looking for certain characteristics that we call these field marks that are going to give the bird away. And field marks could be a physical mark on the body, but also field marks can include um, the wing patterning, but also how they flock. So not just the way the wing looks, but also in flight, does it look different? Or possibly if you're dealing with the way that they feed. So these are all different types of field marks. So first, let's discuss the Dunlin. This is a very, very classic uh, wading, small wading bird here, small sandpiper here in New Jersey that we deal with quite frequently. And they do show up in large groups. So among that group, we're going to be looking for other species to kind of be in there feeding around with them or maybe not maybe on their own uh, but they'll look a lot like dunlin and could be confused with them so first let's discuss the stilt sandpiper so just like the dunlin this is a wading bird with a drooping bill what's known as a decurved bill and you can see that curve uh, in the bill a little bit it drip, droops, droops down at the end um, as they just described here, a rather heavy, slightly drooping bill. Uh, just a word to the wise, before we begin, I'd like to uh, also reference the fact that I'm using photos from the Sibley Guide to Birds by National Audubon Society. I prefer to use the uh, National Geographic book, so the actual Na National Geographic field guide, but this book uh, gives these photos in a different light. It's it's very interesting to see these pictures drawn out. And David Allen Sibley is the uh, writer and illustrator for the Sibley Guide to Birds. He does an amazing job. Now, uh, I prefer the Nat Geo, but this book is obviously just as good. And it gives a better representation, I feel, in photo form when dealing with these pictures. So... First, let's start off with the stilt sandpiper. The stilt sandpiper has longer legs, relatively. They're going to be greenish yellow um, or yellow green, depending on, uh, you know, how it's worded. <laughs> uh, it feeds irregularly uh, and probing rapidly like the Dunlin. But one thing that you'll notice is because of its longer legs, it can be in deeper water than the Dunlin. Uh, so that's something that you definitely want to pay attention to. The depth of the water is another kind of field mark that's not really a mark on the body, but a notable character of the species. So you can definitely tell that the stilt sandpiper, because of its longer legs, can feed in deeper water. So you might see it deeper out uh, than just the mudflats, which is predominantly where the Dunlin will be close to. Um, now, they come in, obviously, we're looking at the three gears, uh, three types of years that we will see, and that would be the juveniles, the adult non-breedings, and the adult breedings. Now, they also come in male and female variants, depending on the individual, and we see that more with the curlew sandpiper than with the stilt or the dunlin, but always be aware that mixed in with a flock of dunlin, you could see any of these birds and multiple more species that we will discuss in a later video. So let's start off with, obviously, we're going to take uh, the stilt sandpiper in comparison to the Dunlin first. Now, if we look at the adult breeding birds in all three of these categories, honestly, they're quite different. And you can really, really tell these birds apart pretty easily. It's a fairly simple 
uh, view of how the adult breeding, the adult breeding, uh, Stilt, Dunlin, and Crow Sandpiper are all very different. Although you can see that uh, the adult breeding female is different than the adult breeding male in the Curlew Sandpiper. But the coloration, the patterning on the female Curlew is different than the adult breeding of the other two Sandpipers as well. But depending on what time of year it is, and very helpfully, underneath the year of the bird, the juvenile, the adult breed, non-breeding, and the adult breeding, it tells you what time of year to be looking for this coloration, which I think is extremely helpful. Uh, and this book really does, the Sibley Guide really does give a good representation of when to be looking for these birds. So let's compare the Dunnelin Juvenile to the Stilt Sandpiper Juvenile. One thing to be aware of is that, one, you should definitely notice the longer legs. Um, now, this is as long as the bird is not wading actively in the water. You should recognize that the stilt sandpiper obviously has yellow legs. You might need a scope for this type of birding because they're going to be small. Obviously, they're only about eight and a half inches, and they're going to be pretty far away unless you get one that's nice and close. But the color that you're going to be looking for is going to be slightly darker on the Dunnelin versus a little bit brighter, grayer, on the Stilt Sandpiper. And the Dunnelin is kind of brown versus the Stilt Sandpiper's gray. Now, one, another thing to point out, um, as is duly noted by my good friend Tom Baxter, who references this quite frequently with juvenile birds, one thing to pay attention to is during those times of year, July to September especially, you're going to be looking for scalloping on the wings. Now, if you look closely at the pictures, you will recognize that on the feathers, they refer to them as scaly on multiple of the species, the stilt sandpiper and the curly sandpiper. And that scaly nature refers to the scalloping on the wings. So the wing has a white fringe around the entirety of it. Every single feather on that wing, on the back, uh, they all have white scalloping edges. So that is something to pay attention to, and that's going to really kind of tell you what year the bird is. The Dunlin have less scalloping than the Stilt and the Curly Sandpiper, um, which would be a, a pretty easy distinction to kind of tell us, uh, you know, apart from what we're looking at. If you see a lot of oh, a scalloping, a scaly appearance, then yes, absolutely pay more attention to that bird, give it a little bit more uh, focus, and try to pull off these other pieces that are going to be different. Now, again, um, we are going to be talking about both the stilt and the curly sandpiper. They all are around the same length, about eight and a half inches, um, with a wingspan of around the same 17 inches on the Dunlin versus 18 inches on the stilt and curlew. These field marks are not going to be easily discernible, even in flight. It's not something that your mind's going to actively pick out of a flying flock. But some things your mind will pick out will be the color of the wings. The Dunlin and the Curlew Sandpiper appear very similar in flight. You'll see them fly in a group. You'll see the coloration, patterning, and things like that. On the, uh, the upper portion of the wing, they look very similar. But on the under portion of the wing, the Stilt Sandpiper is going to give you a very different view. And the upper wing as well. The upper wing of the Stilt Sandpiper and the underwing of the Stilt Sandpiper are pretty dramatic. So if you were to get either a flight photo or uh, see them with your scope or binoculars in flight at a close enough distance, I would almost guarantee you'd be able to tell at least that something was wrong or different with the species. The other thing to pay attention to is, as you can see on the Dunlin, it has a, a very bold dark line down the center of its tail. And then on both sides of the dark line down the tail, there is a, a white patch on each side. The stilt and the curlew, along with multiple other sandpipers that we will discuss in later videos, a lot of them have white rump patches. Now this is definitely something to pay attention to, because if you see a flock of birds flying and something doesn't seem right about that bird, pay a little bit of, it, pay a little bit of attention to it and see if you can figure out if it's got a white rump or not, because that can be a very different species. And with the Dunlin, we'll be looking for smaller sandpipers, as well as the stilt and the curlew. Uh, other sandpipers can include the western, the white-rumped, sharp-tailed. These are all possibilities, and we'll go over a couple more of those birds in later uh, videos in greater detail. But for the moment, let's focus on these three. So the Dunlin is very numerous here. 
you can see that its color is a uh, ruddy back, a rufous back, uh, scallopy kind of feathers, very slight scalloping on the feathers as an adult breeding uh, bird. It's got a black patch on the belly, which is very blatantly obvious because it's very dark and takes up most of the belly. Uh, the other birds don't have that. But in the, the adult non-breeding plumage, they can be very challenging to figure out. So let's go over the two birds that are going to look the most similar during this adult non-breeding period. And that would be the Dunlin and the Curlew Sandpiper, which uh, both occur during August through March. The adult non-breeding Dunlin and Curlew Sandpiper appear similar. Uh, but if we look at the back of the bird, that's going to give you probably the best view, the best uh, variant, and that would be the dull brown back feathers versus the paler gray uh, overall appearance of the curlew sandpiper. The dull brown appearance of the Dunlin versus the gray, uh, pale gray appearance of the back of the curlew sandpiper is a very good giveaway that it's not the same. And again, the stilt sandpiper has a very similar appearance with a darker, uh, paler gray, um, paler gray back. They all have uh, what look, what appear to in the field would be uh, black wingtips. Um, and if you were to look at them, they all have somewhat, as an adult non-breeding bird, they all have a pale breast. But that uh, pale breast would appear more ruddy or rufous uh, on the Dunlin, the Stilt Sandpiper and the Curlew Sandpiper would both show paleness to the color. It wouldn't be brownish per se, it would be more white to slightly gray. So that's another field mark to look for in the field for, for sure. You want to keep your eyes out. Once you get a bird that looks kind of different, you get that in your sights and then you can take that into account overall and try to compare and contrast it to the, to the individual birds around it make sure that it's not just a highly uh, individualized species of uh, the dunlin if it's all dunlin you're just looking at maybe a, a dunlin that that has very extensive uh, genetic coloration that's just a little bit different than the rest of them you want to make sure because those anomalies can occur as well uh, and those can throw people off extremely um, but the other thing to look at for sure when you are in the field is something that the stilt sandpiper as an adult breeding bird shows very well, and that's called the supercilium. So if you look at the eye of the bird, the eye on the face of the bird, you can see a white stripe. Now on the Dunlin, it doesn't show this white stripe as predominantly, and on the curly sandpiper as an adult breeding bird, it doesn't show this white eye supercilium either. But on the stilt sandpiper, it is blatant, it's bold, and it also appears in all three of the years. So if you look at the juvenile, uh, which would occur between July and September, you will see that white supercilium. Uh, it will be less predominant, less pronounced on the Dunlin, but it can be very similar to the curlew sandpiper. In that case, you'd be looking for the reddish color of the curlew sandpiper versus the grayish color of the stilt sandpiper on the the uh the chest sections of the upper chest right where the wing meets the body you'd be looking at those feathers um and if you can tell the difference in those colors that's uh, pretty good it's a pretty good indication uh they both have scaly looking feathers at that age when they are in their juvenile plumage now again the adult non-breeding versus uh, stilt versus curlew is going to show you that grayish color overall the pale breast, and these two are going to be very challenging to separate, except one would be between September and April, and the other one would be August to March. Now, obviously, these months overlap, so it's not like it's the easiest thing to figure out, but they're all around the same time. Um, and one thing to pay attention to would be if you are looking at the adult non-breeding stilt sandpiper versus the adult non-breeding curly sandpiper, Take a look at the wing of the curlew, and you'll notice that on the bottom portion of the wing, it will have brownish flecks of color. It'll be more brown than the stilt sandpiper's overall pale gray appearance. The stilt sandpiper non-breeding is very plain, very, very plain indeed. And only during the adult breeding plumage does it gain its color. It gains a lot of 
of more color in the feather, uh, the feathering on the body, the, the heavily barred breast, the color on the face. The stilt sandpiper is very much a plain bird during that non-breeding plumage, which all three of them are. But obviously you want to pay attention to those certain field marks, like the pale gray color of the stilt uh, and the pale breast of the stilt, but then the curly sandpiper, look for those outer wing edges and look for that brown coloration. Um, it's definitely going to be something that you should keep your eye on. Now, the next thing is something that is not always uh, that showy on the bird. It doesn't always stick out to you immediately. But if we look at the feathers uh, of the wings, the last feather on the wings on all three of these birds, there is a major difference. The Dunlin's wings do not pass the tail. So his feathers, the last feathers of his wings, are before the tail. The tail sticks out beyond it. The tail is, is longer than the feathers. The stilt sandpiper, they're about the same length. They're right around the same length. They just overreach it. And the curly sandpiper does the same thing. It just overreaches the tail. So the Dunlin will, you will not see those wings cross over the tail. They kind of make an X and they're a little raised. You won't see that. Um, because on the Dunlin, obviously, they are appearing before the tail. They will end before the tail. So that's going to be another good, and this, again, something I'm going to point out to you now. Um, when dealing with field guides, something like a picture or a photo, the Crosley field guide is a good example of this. Amazing field guide. It's very wonderful. But what it does is it shows you a photo of one individual bird in the field. And they do that for all the same thing they do here for the years. They show you the years of the birds. Um, but it's a picture, a photograph of one bird. And that's something that kind of uh, I'm not that into. Um, I'd rather see something like what we're seeing with David Allen Sibley's drawings. Um, and that is it's not a single individual bird. It's kind of drawn with a little bit less detail. Um, and that is to give your mind the ability to picture the detail. It adds in the detail instead of a Crosley field guide that gives you full detail of one bird, which can be very good in certain situations. The field guide I tend to use is the National Geographic field guide. Uh, the field guide to birds for National Geographic, obviously it's up to the seventh edition. It's the one I've been using ever since I started birding multiple years ago. But that field guide gives even a little bit less detail than the Sibley guide. And to me, I enjoy that because my mind can then add the uh, detail in as I'm looking at the bird in the field. It lets my mind, uh, gives my mind the ability to kind of add in more of that detail, which I, pref I, uh, I prefer. But the Sibley Field Guide does a wonderful job in comparison. So right here, I'm going to go back to the comparison page. You guys can obviously see the major differences. It looks great. It really does. Um, it shows a very good detail and difference between all three of these, and obviously I'm going to be doing more videos like this to compare and contrast. Um, so, thank you for watching, I appreciate it. Um, and so, again, sorry about the video quality. Uh, I am working on getting a new video capture card. Uh, this is just a personal update. So, thanks, like, uh, subscribe to the channel if you want more details. Um, I'm going to talk for a bit longer about the what I want to happen. Um, so the video quality of this is not probably the greatest. Uh, the sound probably isn't that wonderful. Um, I am doing these videos on my laptop and the lighting in the background. Sorry for the window. It's very bright. Uh, I'm going to be using my new camera, which I just bought recently. This is the Canon um, 5D Mark IV, and I have a 50 millimeter lens on here, which works really, really well. Uh, it's just that I can't capture video directly to it and put it on boom, doop, right there on my screen. So I will be trying to do that eventually. I need to buy some software and hardware to uh, be able to. But until that point, I really hope you guys enjoy the videos. I really hope you guys are uh, appreciating some of the content I'm putting out. And if you're not, that's fine. Let me know in the content. Uh, let me know in the comments what you think i could do better um if you if you just appreciate it i mean hey leave a comment that's totally fine i appreciate it i will try to read as many of the comments as i can and um well thanks like subscribe um smack that bell icon if you really feel like it uh you know get some updates when i'm gonna post again i don't know when that was gonna be but hopefully soon and um 
yeah, uh, I'm going to be doing hopefully some more live shows or some shows with uh, Tom Baxter as well. I'm going to leave his uh, YouTube uh, channel linked in mine as well, in my uh, in my video here. So you guys are going to get a chance to see that. And um, all right. Well, thanks for watching. Appreciate it. And uh, bye, guys. Have a good day.